I'm Calvin Beisner with the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, and it is a delight to be here. Uh, it's a delight to be able to, uh, to shake hands again with so many of these wonderful scientists and, and uh, leaders of, of the, the very battle that art has just, I think, uh, described brilliantly. This is what we're about, saving literally billions of needless premature deaths around the world and saving freedom. One of the real soldiers in that has been Dr. Roy Spencer. And I am so blessed and so privileged to call Roy not only a senior fellow of the Cornwall Alliance, uh, but also my very dear friend, a man whom I admire immensely, uh, who's been involved in the Cornwall Alliance from the very start. In November of 2005, we had a small briefing in a uh, Holiday Inn in Washington, D.C., and Roy was one of the people presenting at that briefing. He did a marvelous presentation on the role of clouds in regulating uh, global average temperature. And when he finished that presentation, Roy, who mentioned earlier that he is a guitar player, he plays in the worship band at his church, by the way. Uh, Roy finished all of that having absolutely astounded us all with the depth of his understanding of how clouds function by singing under his breath, we really don't know clouds at all. <laughs> Which was, by the way, from one of my favorite songs of that period of my life. And that told me something about Roy, that he is a humble man, something that was expressed in the quote from Isaac Newton uh, a couple of minutes ago. I think without humility you cannot conceivably be a good scientist. A good scientist is a servant of the facts, of the truth. As in my field, a good minister, a good theologian is a servant of the scriptures. Two forms of revelation from one revealer, the written word and the created word. And I have the privilege of presenting to Roy the award for Outstanding Evangelical Climate Scientist. Some people are really puzzled. Why, why should religion have anything to do with this? Well, first of all, if you know anything at all about the history of science, you know that most of the greatest scientists throughout the ages have been, at the very least, religious believers, most of them actually Christians, Orthodox Christians. But I'll tell you one quick story. It's the story of Michael Faraday, one of the great, uh, great scientists of the 19th century, who was also a very devout Christian. And he was confronting a puzzle that many scientists at the time had, which was that light seemed, under certain experiments, to, to show the, the uh, characteristics of something that was particulate, as if it was little, little bits and pieces moving along. But under their other circumstances, it showed the characteristics of something that was undulating, wave-like. And according to the theories of the time, those two couldn't both be characteristics of the same thing. But one day, Michael Faraday was meditating on the doctrine of the Trinity, which says that there is only one God, and yet that there are three persons who are that one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Faraday sort of thought, you know, if God can be one spirit, and yet three persons, why couldn't light be both particulate and undulating? And bit by bit from that, he, he built up the, the notion of light as, 
as both particulate and, and undulating, and eventually that was confirmed by empirical experiment. It's not that religious insights necessarily determine your conclusions, but that they can open your eyes to what might be the case. And then, having your eyes opened to what might be the case, you then do the testing. Well, Roy told me about a similar experience for himself. He was thinking one day about Genesis 131, which says that after God had created everything, he, he looked at it all and behold, it was all very good. And he was thinking, you know, this hypothesis that a tiny, tiny change in atmospheric chemistry could cause catastrophe for the whole climate system. Uh, boy, that doesn't seem to be very consistent with that notion. And it made him think, I wonder if clouds might be, instead of a positive feedback that magnifies the influence of added CO2, I wonder if they might be a negative feedback. And that didn't predetermine his conclusion. He then began to do research to find out whether that might be so. It resulted in an article titled, Cloud and Radiation Budget Changes Associated with Tropical Intraseasonal Oscillations, published in 2007, the Journal of Geophysical Research. When I read that article, truly, literally, I mean this, I went to my knees in praise of God for the beauty and the wonder of his creation. Roy helped me, as a Christian, to praise God more for his creation. This is how one can integrate Christian faith and the most outstanding scientific work. And it's for that reason that I am really delighted to be able to give to Roy to present to him the award for Outstanding Evangelical Climate Scientist. Please come up. Okay, I'll, I'll try to make this short and sweet. Um, as Cal knows and others know, um, what we do, we don't do for awards. Um, if we wanted awards and recognition for our views regarding, you know, being skeptics that, of the idea that humans are causing irreversible climate change, if we wanted awards, we would get terrible grades in college in the subject of science. We use our father's political influence to become a politician. <laughs> We'd go on to write a book about how much we care about the earth. And then we would get our awards, both an Academy Award and a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, can you believe the world we live in? Now, um, some people have asked me, um, you know, mainly from the other side, why do you have to bring up, you know, you're a scientist, why do you have to bring up Al Gore? Well, because I think more than any other person, he has corrupted the public debate on global warming. I mean, the things he used to say about what scientists believed uh, the scientists just shook their head. No, yeah, that's really not to what he should be saying, but we'll let him say it anyway because it helps us get more funding. I know because I was part of that, you know, that way of doing business when I was a government employee. So it's a mindset. Um, anyway, I'd like to thank, first of all, my wife. She worked full time to get me through college. And then I had a mentor in the National Weather Service when I worked summers uh, at a weather service office. His name was Fred Day. I was just going to get a bachelor's degree and be a weather forecaster like my good friend Joe Bastardi. Because, you know, I'm a weather weenie at heart like Joe is, although I could never, I could never compete with his weeniness. I mean, <laughs> I, that guy loves weather more than anything I've, yeah, more than anyone I've ever seen. My word. Um, uh, Fred said, no, nah, if you want to control your own destiny, you, you need to go on and get your master's. Uh, okay, so I went ahead and got my master's, and I came back and visited him uh, one summer, and he looked up over his glasses, chomping on his cigar, reading the latest 
directive that came down from National Weather Service headquarters. And, you know, he looked like an orangutan that smoked cigars. And he had a lot of disdain for government employees, you know, or, you know, the government bureaucracy, even though he was a government employee. You know, he'd be reading the latest directive and saying, those acronymic bastards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course, I've created my own share of acronyms over the years. Uh, as a government employee. But, you know, I got, my, I got my master's degree and I come in and he looks up over his glasses and he says, got your master's, huh? Well, you know, if you want to control your own destiny, <laughs> you really need to go on for your PhD. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. I was the black sheep of the, of the family. I was the juvenile delinquent. I was the one that wasn't supposed to go anywhere. Now you want me to go get a PhD? Yeah, if you want to control your own destiny. Well, okay. So, with the help of my wife. We did that. And then along the way, uh, I've had mentors. Uh, Dick Lindzen, who isn't at this meeting. He's been at previous Heartland meetings. Uh, you can disagree with Dick, but you can't ignore him. Uh, he's an amazing intellect. Um, and he sort of taught me climate scientists. See, all of us had to learn climate scientists for the most part after our PhDs because it really wasn't an area of study. We learned weather, we learned atmospheric physics, we learned things that were useful. Climate wasn't useful until global warming. Then that's where all the money was, and I was gonna go where the money was. So I became a climate person, Dick helped me learn. And along, along the way, there were other great meteorologists who helped me, and since I poked fun at Bill Gray, where's Bill, is Bill here this morning? Yeah. Right here. I'll use him as an example. A little story, uh, 35 years ago, I was a fresh PhD going to my first tropical meteorology conference. And Bill Gray, for those that don't know, is you know, sort of the godfather of tropical meteorology. Well, 35 years ago, we were just starting to be able to use numerical weather prediction models to grow hurricanes in a computer. Uh, and yet, because the energetics in a hurricane, which is what I did my PhD on, was the energetics of tropical systems, uh, is pretty complicated. And there was this string of numerical modelers coming up and giving presentations, saying, look at my model. You know, we put in a little tropical disturbance, and it grows into a hurricane. And the next presenter would get up there and, and, and show, and my model, we put a little tropical disturbance, and, and it grows into a hurricane. And after about four of these, uh, Bill Gray, who was seated near me, stood up and said, all you modelers show me everything you know, in the tropics, every little disturbance turning into a hurricane. Most of them don't. Where's your model that doesn't grow a hurricane? <laughs> and I'll always remember that uh, because it was so profound and it's sort of uh, goes along with, you know, global warming. Uh, I showed all the models. They all produce catastrophic global warming, or most of them do. Okay, well, show me a model that doesn't. You know, they're all pre-programmed. You can get whatever you want out of a model. They're guided by your preconceived notions. So people like uh, Bill Gray have, have been an important influence on me, too. So anyway, I just want to thank Heartland for uh, having the... Um, brass pair to do something like this and, uh, and for recognizing some of us that really weren't in it for recognition, but we appreciate it anyway.